Hello. Hello, world. <laughs> Welcome to the Iron Edge group webinar podcast pod podinar webapod webcast webcast whatever. We are uh, we are entering into uh, year eight of 2020, and uh, our podcast webinars are continuing to pile up and. This is probably like our fifth one on security, but I think it's a good one because we're going to talk a lot about um, best practices in regards to building a program and free things that companies, not three, four free gratis things that you can do as an organization to um, move your security best practices forward. My name is Andrew Moore. I'm the COO of Iron Edge Group, and I've got the magnificent Patrick Maese, the Vice President of Client Experience. Hello, hello. Uh, here at the Iron Edge Group, and uh, we are we are excited to uh, to bring this content to you all today. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about Iron Edge Group for like two seconds because we don't like to do sales pitches when it comes to this sort of thing. We really want to get into the content. So let me share my screen here and uh, kind of show you where we're at. And this is screen here. All right. <clears throat> so, Patrick, can you see my screen? I see it. Yep. Fabulous. It's up on my screen. Right, let me see if Good. I can move my controls. Cool. So, four free high impact security best practices for 2021 because 2020 is pretty much over. Thank God. So, moving into 2021, getting ready for next year. So, I'll talk a little bit about Iron Edge. Iron Edge Group is. Uh, the kind of organization that Texas businesses choose to uh, work with when it comes to our security and continuity best practices, helping to do budget and planning for our clients, helping them to get compliant, keep peace of mind. A lot of the times we step in when uh, other companies have outgrown their current IT person or uh, their uh, IT provider. Uh, we bring white glove services to our clients. Uh, and that's because we have people like Patrick on staff who actually know what they're talking about when it comes to <laughs> getting compliant and looking at your budget and planning on security stuff. So um, our focus is really to make sure that our clients are satisfied on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with our service, but that we're also forward thinking and proactive about what we do so we can provide that sort of insight so they can plan uh, for their business to grow uh, and not be surprised by changes in technology or security. Yeah. So that's and to bring it back edge. into security, um, Iron Edge does work in a lot of different industries and a lot of different verticals. Um, so we have a lot of experience in um, all sorts of areas. And so, um, you know, some organizations are, are uh, governed by different industries, um, but because we have experience in all these different uh, areas, we're able to kind of consolidate them, um, you know, and, for, and so for private industries that may not have a specific regulation, uh, it ha it's, it's nice to have that knowledge to kind of cherry pick some of the, the good stuff and, and, and put it all into a, kind of a, a bang for a buck type security initiative. That's a, that's a really good point too. Cause something I do want to let's, let's, let's put that in, in our pocket and get it back out in mm -hmm. here just a little bit, Patrick, cause I do want to talk about um, the arc of security and what it, what it covers. Uh, I think it's really important that we, we touch on, how deep security can go and why it's important, not just for companies that have governance to be on top of it, but even to be able to take that experience and apply it down to organizations that are just looking to get more secure, how you can kind of cherry pick things and really yep. help them to get secure and, and, and apply it to their business. So um, <clears throat> the importance of security in 2020 and beyond, um, $6 trillion annually in cybercrime uh, that's gonna happen uh, in 2021. So in 2015, that was three trillion. Uh, we're talking trillion with T's. Um, I think it's it's wild that um, when I started doing technology um, back in like the early part of uh, this um, this century, uh, in in like 1998, 99, yep. and into 2000, I remember um, when we would install network systems for people. Um, a lot of the times we would have to insist that they they used antivirus, right? And they would be like, nah, it makes my computer slow, right? Like, I'm not really worried about it. Like most of them didn't have a firewall for se. They were just using like, like IP addresses that were assigned to them by like whatever the router was. And like, yeah. and I yeah. remember asking, I remember as Patrick, I, I was talking to a client, I had set up Microsoft uh, 
mail. It was like NT4 mail. It was the first time I'd ever done it. And I was like, who needs email in your organization? And uh, cause I was having to set up the addresses and stuff. Cause you had to manually do it back then. And, and he was like myself, there was like a, uh, like a 50 person organization. He's like myself and our, our secretary and that's it. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah. Cause I don't want them to get distracted with email. Because emails, like, it's just not necessary. You know, what's you know, interesting is back in the day, because I was right there with you, um, you know, at the time, antivirus was really your only protection mechanism. And that's because, mm-hmm. you know, people were writing viruses just to be destructive. I mean, they weren't, they didn't really have an agenda beyond let's create something because I can, because I can do yep. damage. And so antivirus was a method to really kind of prevent that or block that, right? Yeah, but it's evolved into an industry in in of in, in, in of of itself, where you know, really, it's about money. Everything's about money, right? And so once yeah. they learn that they can make money off of this stuff, then this industry, this dark web industry, really sort of evolved and said, okay, how do I make money out of doing nefarious things? And it's really about you know what's important to them, what's what is valuable to them, and that's going to be your data, right? It's going to be information that they can use and sell across the dark web. And that's everything right. from credit card information to, you know, p- you know, personal identification information, like, you know, social security numbers, addresses, driver mm-hmm. license information. Heck, even like, uh, you know, membership, uh, membership, like card numbers and stuff like that. All that stuff is sold and traded and like an Amazon online, right? You just go in there and you say, I want to buy a credit card information and here's a dollar. Well, and and that's, that's, you know, to your point, right? You can buy and sell the data, but you can also like, to the point that, that, that I was trying to get out a little earlier with the exchange thing, right? You have to be on top of like the different changes that happen to your business because of technology, right? Because you go Mm -hmm. from fax machines and handwritten letters and checks delivered by mail to electronic wire transfers and email communications and using chat and stuff like that. And now you've got this data that could potentially be intercepted in different ways, right? Like all of the data that that could be regarding your business. And maybe it's not just a credit card. Maybe it's one of your business processes that can uh, can be deciphered from the outside and turned against itself in order for these people to steal money, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's, you know, forcing a wire transfer, stuff like that. So I think that it can land in various ways and that people are just becoming more and more sophisticated as more and more of our business processes become tied to these electronic systems. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really, I think it's really important that people understand that this is not going away. It's actually going to get more and more prevalent. Um, And again, I'm sure there's quite a few people that are participating in this call that don't remember what it was like back before there was like everything was on the internet and before yeah. everything was was happening. So um, that's why it's super important that everybody's aware of it. Um, and it's even more important as we look at um, how people's businesses have changed. We've talked about this in one of our other um, uh, webcasts because of people going remote or having a distributed workforce where some people are in the office and some people aren't. Um, it's really important that um, businesses begin to understand how their programs are set up mm-hmm. so that they can mitigate those risks because a lot of people rushed to go remote because of COVID and then maybe rushed back, but didn't think about what happens if certain parts of their business are long, no longer. Um, yeah. And that's a great point. Way, I mean, right? you, you spend a lot of time and energy and money into securing your, your business and your corporate infrastructure. And with COVID, everyone's kind of, you know, going back and working from home and, you don't have that same level of control over the house, right? And in fact, the FBI just recently released a bulletin that said, okay, you know, everyone's kind of sick of working at home. So they're starting to work in in hotels. And they're like, you know, you got to be careful with that because you're going to be on their hotel Wi-Fi and that's not secure. And you might be transmitting, you know, sensitive information that's easily, you know, uh, compromised from, you know, just a weak internet or weak Wi-Fi connection. So... Absolutely. Well, we're going to, we're going to kind of dive into a little bit about, um, you know, how companies can help mitigate some of this risk by not spending money. Right. So, and I know time is money. So it's a little tongue in cheek for us to say that these are free because all companies are going to wind up paying 
something for additional security, whether that's in some software um, or new protocols or the time it takes people to develop new processes or write things down. But from an actual hard cost perspective, um, these are things that companies, we're gonna get into a little bit about things that companies should be doing in order that don't cost them any discernible um, out-of-pocket expense, right? Um, a lot of this stuff is just setting aside some time with a couple of key members of the organization and focusing on uh, documenting stuff, um, writing up processes. Um, you know, sometimes it's as simple as understanding where your data is because a lot of companies don't, they don't understand where the, you know, strategically what it means to look at that data. And if you just take a couple of minutes to, to, to spend some time around this stuff, it, it seems like a, like a, oh, duh kind of thing where you're like, yeah, I totally understand that. Like, but once you write it down on paper, it, it really does start to change things, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to jump right into tools and resources. So Patrick, I know you've been working yeah. with some of our more advanced clients on DFARS and CMMC and mm -hmm. NIST and SOX and um, FINRA and, you know, every acronym you could throw at it. So kind of, why don't you like, yeah, explain no. what you've talked to me about, about how this stuff Definitely, works. definitely. So like we mentioned earlier, you know, over the past couple of decades, uh, it's gotten to a point where, you know, this, this whole industry exists about stealing data and stealing information and trading that, you know, on, on the dark web. Right. And so to combat that, there has been a lot of, you know, various initiatives and various, uh, um, you know, programs that have been developed over the years uh, to help uh, industries and companies uh, build security systems or build security programs. Uh, and then really one of the biggest ch challenges for any company is like, where do I start? You know, security is such a, such a, you know, ambiguous topic. It's like, how do I, how do I, where do I even look? Where do I even start? Right. And so there's a lot of tools and resources out there that help you get started. Uh, one of the big ones uh, that we look at is NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has existed since the early 20th century. It's a government ent entity. Um, early, I think in 20, 2014, uh, the it's a Department of Commerce where um, they created this, this cybersecurity framework as a tool or a resource to help all sorts of indus industries. It was a it was a uh, um, it was a collaborative effort between the government, between academia, between private industries, and they sort of pulled together all these different you know uh, uh, industries together to build a framework that you can use to uh, build a security program around. Right, uh, and so it. It, it works both for the government industry and it works for small businesses. It works for, you know, big industries. It works for, uh, you know, people that have specific compliance requirements, like say like, you know, PCI or the financial industry. It's very flexible in a way that you're able to uh, use that as, as sophisticated and as, as deep as you want, or you can kind of keep it generic and real high level, right? And so that's what's great about it, right? And so NIST has this cybersecurity framework at, published as a way that you can use to start this security program. And there's a couple other ones out there. There's one um, called a CMMI. Uh, that one's the, the uh, capability maturity model in, uh, integration. And it's complementary. It's similar. It's a, it's a, it's a similar, uh, it's a similar system to build a security system. And in fact, they share a lot of similarities, right? Uh, so the government um, started uh, the CMMI program as well uh, really as a way to regulate uh, software development. Uh, but what they've done is they're starting to merge a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, I know the government, say, for example, you're in the government uh, vertical. Uh, previously, over the past you know, five or 10 years, uh, you had what was called DFARS, which is a way of, of um, uh, reaching a level of compliance for government stuff. Uh, and they started to move over towards the CMMI or the CMMC model. Uh, and they share a lot of the, the core uh, information and that's all based on NIST. So typically when we start looking at a security program, uh, NIST is a great, great, great uh, resource for you to, you know, to dive into and understand because it, 
it basically lays everything out for you on how that works. And real high level, not just, I won't spend a whole lot of time here, but um, NIST, what you want, what it's telling you to do is really you wanna identify what's important to your organization, right? And that's everything from you know data, uh, it's anything from governance, which we'll touch on here in a minute, uh, but really identifying what's critical and what's important to your business. Uh, and then from there, you want to move to protecting that information is how do you protect that, that, you know, the crown jewels of your organization. Uh, and so you're, that's, that's step two is protecting what you identified. And then step three, what you move from there is detecting, right? So you want to detect how, you know, if something happens, what tools and, you know, what services that you have that, you know, are able to detect if something happens to that important information. And then finally, the last two components of the NIST model is to respond. And that's everything from like a disaster recovery plan, a business continuity plan itself. So if something happens to that data, how do you respond to it? So you want to have a plan in action that you can respond to, uh, you know, if something occurs. And then finally is to recover, right? So you want to recover if you have a breach or if you have something happen what do you do to recover from that situation? So really the big five are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And those are the, the, the five major categories. And it, and it outlines everything in detail beyond that, but those are the big things to take away, right? Well, and, and it, NIST is, it can read like stereo instructions, like the, mm -hmm. the, C, the, the cybersecurity framework. Um, but for small businesses, there are like, so many tools on the internet that are available to you that are free, literally that line out checklists on how to start. Um, and I think what, what every, what every organization wants to look back on is it's like, how do you, how do you uh, carve up the elephant? Right. It's very complicated to figure out what the most important things are, right. In order to start putting together a program and understand how to make your, your organization more secure. And I think that that's, a really good segue into there's all these things that you can do right and there's 110 mm -hmm. different like controls that you can put in place to make your organization more secure and to, you know and to, to follow up but um, from a free perspective um, we wanted to let everybody on the webcast know these tools exist you just have to google them um, as a matter of fact when we when we post our our webinar follow-up we're going to have some links to some of the NIST stuff so you can go link to it and, and, and check it out but a lot of the good news is, is most of the heavy lifting has been done, right? You don't have to figure this thing out from scratch. And, and the, the most important thing you can really do uh, to start with, with your organization is to focus on identifying step one, like what level of governance overrides your organization. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's an easy, easy, um, you know, an easy achievement to tackle, right? And and really this comes down to where you are in an in industry, right? So oftentimes each industry typically has some level of a published security uh, information. So like if you're in a retail vertical, uh, PCI, um, which is credit card information uh, is, is widely available. And that's something that you have to achieve to uh, to do business in, in a retail vertical. And that's really about protecting credit card information. You know, you have the medical industry, which has HIPAA, and that's protecting that medical information. Um, you have the financial industry, which is SEC, FINRA, FDIC. A lot of these, a lot of these entities publish requirements that you need to do to adhere to that industry, right? Uh, the government has their own. Uh, and so, if you are part of one of these industries that's already has a published security program, that's a great way to get started, right? Because it, it typically outlines everything you need to do step by step in order to be quote compliant in that industry. And so that's step one, right? Like if you exist in one of these, one of these verticals or the industries, that level of governance tells you what you need to do to get started. And that's well, where you would get started. And let me hop in on that too, because maybe you're not in a regulated industry, okay. right? Yeah, Let's exactly. just say that you're in manufacturing and it's not something that's regulated, right? right. Like, or, right. um, so you know, yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. What I would, what I would say is that there are other places you could look right. Like to see what level of governance should override your organization. It might be something as simple as you having a, 
uh, errors and omissions or cybersecurity insurance policy, right? That you need to be on top of so that you can identify what you have to do at minimum in order to protect your organization, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that that's really important to remember. Exactly, exactly. And one of the things that we typically do uh, when we're sort of handholding a lot of these organizations through this process is if you don't if you don't live in one of these verticals that already has something published for you, you start looking at uh, really you know contracts with your vendors. Uh, a lot of the times when um, you've signed an agreement or a contract with uh, a vendor, if you look through that contract, it typically has some safeguards on you know data security, right? It's saying how are you protecting this information? How are you protecting this data? Uh, and so what we typically do as kind of a second step is start pulling in a lot of these agreements and contracts and, and your cybersecurity insurance, for example, and reading through them and understanding what legally you're bound to when you sign these agreements. Because a lot of times they're kind of glossed over or skipped over. But in reality, for example, if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not adhering to, say, uh, a, a response that's outlined in your cybersecurity insurance form, and you're going beyond that, they can, they can very easily not pay for, uh, you know, something that you're, you're buying because you didn't follow the letter of the law. And so it's super important that you start looking at this and writing them down, going through each of these contracts and agreements and saying, is there anything that says anything related to cybersecurity or data security? Because uh, oftentimes a lot of these agreements are starting to write that in because it's important for uh, not only to, to protect the relationship between you and your vendors, but uh, it protects them from, uh, you know, say you don't do any security in your environment, it protects them from your lapse of security, right? Yeah, and and I think that's really important to remember in that um, you're really focused on your information and understanding where the information is and protecting the information and the people um, that are touching that information having controls and safeguards around that, right? So again, one of the best free things that you can do is really just start to baseline what you absolutely need to do um, as an organization to be either compliant or to um, mitigate your risk in regards to your insurance or your monetary risk, like figure out what that governance looks like. In some instances, like with, with HIPAA and others, um, there's not necessarily like, um, somebody that comes in and like gives you an accreditation for it, right? Um, it's best practices, but it opens you up to liability as an mm -hmm. organization if you're not following some of these things in the event of a data loss uh, or a breach. Um, and so it's it's also a differentiator for your organization, for our company. Um, we have spent the better part of, of at least the last seven years or more um, using our um, focus on securing the data that we maintain for our clients and securing our infrastructure, um, we would always go a little above and beyond what, you know, was considered industry standard for, for a managed services provider. And so it worked as a, as a differentiator in our industry. And it actually helped us grow our business because clients like to hear in a competitive sales cycle that our company was in a position to offer higher levels of security when it came to their data. And the same as your clients might also want to hear the same thing. And you could put it into your, your marketing and sales material. So, yeah. There's a lot of reasons to do it, um, but you probably should take the time to identify what your governance could or should be. Uh, and, and as Patrick alluded to earlier, the first thing in any system um, that you put together regarding data strategy and putting together a security program, um, or sorry, putting together a security program is data strategy, right? You focus entirely on where this data lives. Right? Where are your core parts of data? Whether that's employee information, like PII, uh, personally identifiable information. So that could be employee social security numbers. It could be, and some of this stuff could be electronic security. Some of this could be physical security. I know it sounds goofy, but like are you know, your employee files printed somewhere and are they in a locked folder or file system uh, in a room with a locked door? Right, and do you know who's got access to that room or those files? Um, those things can open you up to liability. Where where is the information that is required for you to to lock it down? And not only that, like how do you um, how do you make money? 
right? I always ask our clients that, and I don't mean it tongue in cheek, especially when we first start working with, with a new client, when I ask, okay, so tell, explain to me how you make money, right? And I know that sounds like kind of a goofy question to ask sometimes, but from our perspective, we always want to know what it is that you do in order to generate revenue and to pay bills. And so those will then start to say, okay, so those are your work processes. What technology systems or data are required for those processes to function, right? Is it a special like operating machine that's on your floor as a manufacturer? Is it a, you know, a, a legal um, file structure system that you used for case management? Is it um, a, a, a patient management system or solution? Is it, you know, do you interface with an insurance company in order to process billing? Like, what do you do in order to generate these invoices and then accept these payments so that your company can, can, can make money? And then those systems you start to look at and you start to make decisions as to the data that are in those silos. How is that data protected? How are the systems that support that data? How are they protected? And it's not just a matter of a data strategy and saying, well, I don't want somebody to access those because access is certainly a part of it. But once you actually sit down and write out, these are the core applications and systems and places where we have information that's critical to how we run our business. Some of that information may not have PII in it. It may not have social security data. It may not have, um, it may not have credit card data in it, but it might just be, that is a core piece of our, of our company's business. And if our systems were to be breached, and that system were be to be incapacitated, let's say ransomware were placed on it somehow, could we recover from that, right? So that's when you look at the data strategy because then you start to identify these silos of information and systems within the way that you do business. And then you can start managing the risk around those, right? And it really lays the groundwork for how you start to, to start as an organization, begin to realize, oh, it's not just... Do I, do I have multi-factor authentication on my email? It's not just whether I have, you know, virus protection on my computers. It really is a very layered approach. And you start to realize there's a lot more to this than just making sure that I got good backups, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, and I would add, um, you know, the monitoring component of things is like, you know, you may know that, you know, this folder on your server has, you know, super critical in information, um, but, are you able to, to monitor that in some way, shape or form, right? Because with the existence of like OneDrive and Dropbox and all these other tools, this data starts to kind of, you know, float away, right? It'll, it'll be, you'll find data that's living on laptops and workstations and people take it home and put it on their computers so they can work on it. And suddenly you have a lot of your information and data that's just scattered all over the place and you don't really know where that is, right? And so, you know, data loss prevention, DLP, uh, you know, is one of these, you know, big, big time things these days on how to control, uh, you know, that sort of information so that it's not, uh, it's not out of your, out of your site. And so that's just being able to control it and monitor it and, and have your arms around your data uh, is just as important as knowing where it is. Yeah. And, and to, to touch on, to touch on this a little bit, like real world scenario, we were brought into a situation where a company had been uh, hacked, right? And it started with password complexity, where they didn't have a complex set of passwords uh, on their network, and their organization was compromised and ransomware was distributed on their network. Um, and I don't think that there was a realization prior to this happening that they had machines that they used to generate um, manufactured products that were integrated back into this backend computer system. And those databases were locked because of this ransomware. And when that happened, they were unable to do business and their whole company just shut down, right? Wow. And within a couple, thanks, I, <clears throat> within a couple of, uh, my puppy, within a couple of, uh, <laughs> of weeks of having this happen, uh, they completely went out of business. Yeah. 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 It, it's happened. So, you know, having, having a security breach like that can have real, real dire consequences for an organization. Cause they, in this instance, they didn't have a way to recover from it. Uh, and so it, simply it was a, it was a business 
uh, business down situation where they could not recover and they simply went out of business. So it's, there's some real threats to it for sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that I think is, is, is important that you touched on before too, when it comes to data strategy is um, we call it uh, shadow IT. Um, something that I think is really important. Again, these are all free things that organizations should be doing going department by department, going system by system, process by process, really taking a few minutes to sit down and figure out exactly um, where the processes and data are in the systems, because you'll find out from what we call shadow IT is that there are people that are using systems like Dropbox that you didn't know that they were using, right? They're like, oh yeah, we've totally incorporated this cloud-based system into how we manage this part of our business. And all of a sudden, you didn't realize it existed, right? And now you've got, as Patrick said, data floating out or potentially critical information that should be secured that's no longer being secured or backed up. So taking the time to write this stuff down and to go through the process of figuring out where it is and how it works is really, really important. Because like, I mean, I, I know it's, it's even happened in the early days of this company. I was like, why are we using this product, right? Where did this come from? And yeah. we have to kind of sit down and wrangle it. Yeah, no, and typically users will will employ these tools uh, and applications because uh, it makes it easy for them, right? And so oftentimes, as an organization, you'll say, look, this is the only single solution that, you know, is approved, which may be, you know, only access files on a, a local file server. Well, to do your job efficiently, and especially in the world of COVID, when you need to work from, you know, remotely, that may not work, right? And so what happens is a lot of times users will just start to use tools that are easy for them. And so as you're going through this process, like Andrew mentioned, is like identifying these applications that, you know, some of your users may be uh, employing for these purposes is understanding why they're doing that, right? Why are they using these tools? Uh, maybe it's time to reevaluate how you're, you know, the, the, the tools that you're using as an organization to, uh, to better, uh, better facilitate your users to work properly. And in that process, you can start molding security around these tools to help you not only be more secure, but also allow your users to uh, be more efficient and do their job better by giving them the tools that they need to do to work efficiently. Well, and, and you brought something up, you just mentioned something where you were like, well, in order to work more efficiently or to work faster or whatever, and this is what we hear a lot, right? And, I'm, and then we're going to get to our next topic here because this is kind of, this will lead into it. Mm -hmm. what, what I think is critical is that people understand. So there's a balance on security, right? Oh yeah. Like we can secure your environment. Literally, we can like put a computer somewhere that it's not connected to any internet and there's no way to plug external devices into it. And it's literally like standalone and you can't get to it and you can't access it. Like, unless you have like a super secret password and all this stuff, like that's not how business works. It's not going to be helpful. Right. And you can't work. So, yeah. <laughs> you, you swung too over, far. You swung yeah. too far. Yeah. But at the other side of it, there's this, I don't want to have to worry about putting in a multi-factor password to get to my stuff. Right. That takes too long. I don't want to have to, um, you know, use this, this VPN in order to get to my network. I just want to like be able to get to this cloud thing. And I don't want to have to have a secondary form of authentication. And like, this is hard. And like, that's not going far enough. Right. And I, and I urge all of our listeners and people that are participating in this uh, either now or later, as they go through this, that they understand that security takes a couple of extra minutes, like going to unlock the door to your house takes an extra minute rather than leaving it unlocked, right? That's because you wanna keep your house secure, right? Same with multi-factor authentication, same with any of these other things because using standard passwords was a very 20th century thing because that was all that was available. And that, that set of protocols is completely easy at this point to circumvent. And so it's important that everybody remembers that it's really up to organizations to start saying, we care enough about our employees, our revenue, our clients to write these things down, create these strategies, secure this, these systems. And in doing so, we take a couple of extra minutes time by implementing new strategies to, to lock these systems down, right? And so that's when we come into like password complexity, which I'm super passionate about because this is, this is free. Almost all uh, major systems at this point um, will provide the ability to do password auditing, to set password complexity levels, and 
frankly, to put multi-factor authentication in place, right? So I, it, it's- Yeah, multi-factor or, or dual factor, I would say, you know, maybe a year or two, maybe three years ago, it was kind of like, yeah, that's nice to do. It's optional, but it's nice to do. In this day and age, it's really a requirement. I mean, you have to put multi-factor authentication on any system and really yeah. everything exists. That's everything from text messages to little, you know, RSA key, like number generation stuff. Uh, but it's a second form of authentication that in this day and age really is a requirement to, to have in place. Um, so, you know, multi-factor authentication is, is important. And then the fact that it's just so hard to, to keep track of having 10, 20, 30, 50 passwords, right? Um, the industry is starting to move towards uh, a single sign-on uh, solution. Uh, and that is so that you log into one place uh, and then you're authenticated or the gates open to all of your different products. Uh, that's really kind of the next evolution beyond multi-factor authentication, just because you have all these different, everyone's starting to use cloud, you know, cloud systems like Office 365 and all these other diff different uh, SaaS solutions. And it's hard to, to, to keep track of those. But, you know, if you don't, have the time and resources to implement something as sophisticated as single sign-on, which can be very complicated and not a lot of, not a lot of products may not even yet support it. A simple solution is a password manager. Uh, password manager is a great way to have, you know, a super, a super strong password that unlocks the keys to all of your passwords, right? Uh, and it makes it easy enough that you can, if you're a small business, you can implement something like that uh, and it gives you the next level of security. Uh, that way you're not using the same password across all of your systems, which is, as everyone knows, that's, that's, that's something that you, you really want to try to avoid. Well, and, and then this is free, right? Like this is, mm -hmm. this is something that companies can be doing to make themselves more secure. And this literally costs you no more money. Yep. Like they don't charge you extra for MFA on Office 365. They don't charge you extra for MFA on, um, you know, LinkedIn or, you know, anything else that you might use, whether for that's a marketing system, or, you know, if you're using QuickBooks online, like all these things are built into these systems now for free. Um, and it's important too, because we typically hear from the executive level that they're the ones that don't want to do this. Right. Um, and they're the ones that are the targets, right? So people see them on LinkedIn and they know that they're, email is a certain, you know, email address, right? It's not hard to guess what your email address is. If I know your first and last name or what company you work at, like we have a marketing team, that's their whole job is to go out and use tools to figure out what people's email addresses are. So they can go find these, these, these usernames pretty easily. And what Patrick alluded to is that if you've used these passwords, right? If you use the same password over and over and over again <clears throat> on multiple systems, whether that's logging into the local country club to get your golf scores or that's, you know, signing up for, um, you know, the haircut place or whatever, those data systems sometimes are insecure. And that data gets onto the internet, right into the dark web. And so if that information is out there, where they've got your name, and or your work email address associated with a password that you use across all of the different things that you log into, it's not hard for them to then log into your office 365 when you're not paying attention, and set up auto forwarding, or do some other nefarious stuff. Um, and really get to know your business and eventually rip you off, right? And having multi-factor authentication fixes a lot of that because you can't mm -hmm. get into those systems without it generating a passcode that shows up on your phone, right? Like that's yeah. super important. Yeah, and it's, and you know, a lot of these nefarious actors are really looking to, you know, try to find the, the quickest way to grab this information. And so if you put up enough roadblocks that make it difficult for these people, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes they'll just kind of move on to the next easier target, right? So you want to put up enough, enough resistance, enough roadblocks that, uh, that, that persuades these people to kind of move on to perhaps a, a less secure target. Yeah. And, and again, it's free. There's no reason not to do it. There really isn't like the excuse of, well, it's just harder to get logged in. Like, there's app passwords that can be set up so that you can maintain MFA and still be able to get into stuff on your phone and whatnot and make it simpler. Mm -hmm. Like there's absolutely no reason not to move this forward. So I, I really, I really encourage it. My, my dog is barking affirmative. He's like, yes, you should. Do no, the this. one takeaway is with passwords is if you have MFA 
available to you, turn it on because that's that's critical. Yeah, and and make sure your passwords are at least somewhat complex, right? And most most systems allow you to do that. So we've we've beaten that horse a little bit. Um, so written policies and guidelines, right? So it's the last thing we'll talk about today. And I think this is super important, um, which is to go through and like actually write this stuff down, right? Like it's free to do that. Like it doesn't cost you any additional money to, to write this down. And some of this stuff you'd be surprised, you've probably already written it down. Like, do you have an electronic use policy, right? Do you have a mobile device policy for, you know, uh, BYOD, right? Do you have these things already written down? And in which case you're like, oh, we do. Okay, are we enforcing them? I don't know, are we, right? Like having, taking the time to start to write some of this stuff down, like writing down, like where is our data, right? Where does it live? Like, how does it work? Like who's responsible for it? <laughs> how does it get backed up, right? All of these are really important things that organizations could be doing to ensure that your organization is secure because this information can now be shared and it can be, um, provided to other people in the organization as a roadmap for how their departments play into this, right? Because Patrick, like NIST starts with data strategy and guidelines and processes, right? Like writing all that down. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, um, really having it, and, and really it comes back to the fact that security is not a time and place and a certain um, snapshot, right? It's really a living breathing process and program that exists from, you know, from inception until ever, right? It's like, you know, the, the, the hackers aren't going to rest on their laurels. And so your security really can't either, right? And so as you're building this, you know, writing this stuff down, it's important to remember that, you know, it's not, it's not a, a, you know, chiseled in stone, right? You go through this and you update it and you change it when you when you uh, decide you want to adopt, say, multi-factor authentication, we just we talked about, um, maybe that didn't exist two years ago, right? But you're doing it now, and so you want to go into these these documents in this way that you that you reference in your organization uh, to continue to continue to update them, right? And so you'll go through them, you'll say, well, this isn't working these days, or this isn't strong enough, and so we'll go in there and we'll update it and add new stuff, maybe take some stuff out, and so this is really this process kind of. Uh, evolves, but you really need to get it, get started, start writing this stuff down because you know that it's going to, it's going to get more and more complex, or you may start to trim stuff out, but it's this living, breathing document that you're going to be using uh, in your, in your organization to reference uh, from here on out. But you remember like one of the things that you, you just said, which I think is super critical is don't write it down and then just put it on a shelf somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you, you have to update this on a regular basis. You have to review it. Otherwise it doesn't, like you've written it down. And if you never go back and like take a look at it again, like in, sometimes in six months, 12 months, it's not even like viable, right? Yeah, yeah, it'd be outdated. And really uh, like with any sort of system or network or organization, you're always changing stuff regardless. Like you say, you decide you you want to move your email to a different provider. Uh, really it's it's those sort of, uh, substantive changes in your environment that you want to use as a, as an opportunity to look at your, your, your security and say, are we still doing this right? Is there more, more that we can do to our environment now that we have new tools available to us? Uh, and so all this stuff is ever evolving. And, you know, a lot of these hosted solutions like Office 365, which everyone's adopting, they're continuing to add more and more security. So it's always good to look to see what's the latest and greatest and the newest uh, and maybe something that you want to adopt and add to your to your security uh, program. Yeah, I've 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 never I've never worked with an organization that was like, man, we really just or we regret the amount of time it took for us to document how this worked. <laughs> um, it, it's it's super important. And, and when you write down the processes, one of the other things that I think is is important. That I touched on a second ago was you can start to explain how the processes should work to other people. Um, one of the ones I use all the time as a written process that I think is critical is, um, you know, we've, we've been asked by clients in the past um, where somebody transferred money, right? In their accounting department, they wired money to the wrong person. They were tricked, right? They got attacked via email. And we've had a couple of clients over the past 10 years that felt strongly that 
we as an organization, Iron Edge, had not necessarily done our due diligence in protecting them from that sort of thing. And frankly, it wasn't something that was on their email system, right? The clients, it came from the outside of the organization. Somebody else had gotten hacked and they were at fault and they sent that information um, through, through a hacked email address externally. But what, what we asked at the time, right, of these clients, and since, since they, they've, they've made changes to how they work, if you don't have a written process for how you're supposed to authenticate a wire transfer or a change of monetary transmission, whether that's an employee saying, I've changed banks, I need you to, to, to do something for me to start sending my direct deposit to another location, where you have a client that says, hey, on that invoice, I need you to change my routing number to this from this. If you don't pick up the phone and have a verbal conversation with somebody or have some sort of like secondary authentication method by which you're doing that sort of thing from a security standpoint, um, you you are like technology is not going to fix that problem, right? You can't fix that problem by just having more email uh uh, security in place. You can't fix that problem by having better spam filters. Like you don't fix those problems that way. And so in order for that to work, you have to write those processes down, right? And you have to then go back and train people on it and coach them and see if there are things that evolve over time when you learn lessons, if they can be updated so that you're aware of what's going on because people's attack vectors are changing constantly, right? Because as hard as you're working to keep these people from stealing from you, they're working just as hard to try. They're probably working harder no, to sure, try to get yeah. your, your money and your data. Yep. Yeah. Right. So I think that's super important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's really like kind of the crux of, of, of the, 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 the goal of today was just to kind of talk about if you were to start to look at your security and start to try to put a program together, what free things could you be doing as an organization? Um, and I feel pretty strongly that like, as long as you're writing things down, you're identifying where your data is and like how you get to it and how you protect it, um, putting good passwords in place, Right, and really kind of understanding what kind of governance you want to have to oversee that program, like those will take you 80% of the way, right, in putting a program together. Because mostly a program is all like prep work, right? That's kind of the way I feel about it. So, um, Patrick, is there anything else you want to add? Anything we didn't uh, touch on? Anything we missed? Yeah, no, I mean, we hit the highlights, and really, there's it goes as deep as you want to. I mean, security can get very, very very detailed, right? And and it's a very dense subject. Um, and we just we just skim the surface on uh, yeah. you know the real high level stuff, right? Uh, and I mean, again, I encourage everyone to uh, if if you have the time, just look at the NIST cybersecurity framework. It's a great great resource. Uh, and in fact, we Iron Edge will we we engage with companies and 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 uh, organizations and really just handhold them through that process, right? Because it can be complicated and they just want someone to be their, their security Sherpa, right? They just want someone to kind of say, okay, I know this exists, it's freely available. It's more than I even want to deal with, uh, but we just need to go through that process. If you have the, the time and resources, I encourage you to, to look at those as those tools and resources that we mentioned earlier, because it's all freely available for you and you can certainly do it on your own. Um, but again, you know, uh, what we do is we just use those same resources and we help uh, organizations through the process just by, you know, helping them walk through that, those, those resources. Right. Well, and you never know what could happen. I mean, it's not just whether you get hacked. I mean, your systems could go offline. Like somebody could be in your server closet and bump the rack with their butt and accidentally yeah. unplug all this it stuff. Happens. I mean, it's, that's, that's happened. Yeah. So I've been told Patrick. I don't know. I, I think it's me. a, it's myth. It's, it's, the, it's myth, myth the legend. Um, so thank you all for, for participating today. Uh, and uh, I hope that, uh, that you were able to learn a little bit of something. Um, I will show you guys this. This is what we call the gutter Muppet. <laughs> yeah, this is my dog. So gutter he, Muppet, huh? Yeah, gutter Muppet. He was, he was up here because school changed. So my wife had to go pick up our son today. So yeah. maybe we'll have to start scheduling these at, at a time when the dogs aren't going to be in and out of the, of the office. I didn't consider that. But, uh, but we appreciate everybody being here today and we look forward to uh, bringing you guys more content over the course of the next few months of 2020. So be on the lookout. We've got some great um, uh, webinar podcasts that are coming up with some partners like ATKG, it's accounting firm that we work with out of the San Antonio office. Um, and uh, into, uh, into December where we're gonna be doing some stuff with uh, some of our banking friends out of San Antonio and Austin. So um, we're really excited. So 
we appreciate we appreciate all the goodness we'll uh we'll see you all very soon thank, thank you thank you all appreciate it have a great afternoon bye